As I said, my name is Caitlin and I'll be your moderator today. So we're here now to talk about vision, right? So critique means very little without vision. This changes everything is all about envisioning a path through the crisis we face that leads us to a better world. Vision gives us direction. It brings us together to fight for what we want, not just against what we detest. In the following session, we're going to sketch out and discuss what kind of world we should be fighting for. It's in no way comprehensive, it's not a blueprint, but a set of values and principles that can inspire and inform our struggle for deep, meaningful, and lasting system change. Um, so our first speaker is going to be Kate Rayworth. Would you like to stand with me? <laughs> is this microphone on? Hello? Yes, it is. Thank you. All right. So Kate, you're a leading thinker in alternative economics, specializing in the relationship between sustainability, human rights, and social equality. You've questioned the validity of economic growth and GDP as measures of social progress. Could you talk a little about this and tell us what a fairer, more sustainable economy would look like? Hello, folks. Um, yeah, I think it's really important to think about what things look like. We've got a very powerful visual intelligence that is looking for a positive vision of where we want to get to. And we need to feed our visual intelligence. And as Natalie Bennett and others have said, give ourselves images, whether it's drawing pictures or drawing graphs. And I want to share with you today just one image that I've drawn that I think can help us start having that positive vision. Dan here is going to help me. There it is. Okay. I'm, like, I'm just going to run up to talk to that picture. Can I run past you? Okay. So on the outside of that circle is a set of what's called nine planetary boundaries. A group of Earth system scientists said, what is it about this planet that's been so remarkably stable and beneficial to humanity for the last 10, 11,000 years? That's given us fertile soil, ample fresh water, a protective ozone layer, a stable climate, bountiful biodiversity. And they said, we think there are nine critical Earth system processes that are helping to keep us in this safe space that has allowed humanity to prosper so well. So you've got climate change right there at the top. You've also got fresh water use, not using too much nitrogen and phosphorus in, in fertilizers, ocean acidification, chemical pollution, loading the atmosphere with aerosols like particulates of sulfate, ozone depletion, biodiversity loss, and land use change. And they said, we believe we have to keep a watching eye on all of these nine. And the big two are climate change and biodiversity loss. Because if we push these over a threshold, we can tip our system. We're all here today because we absolutely understand that climate change system is massively under threat and massively at risk of tipping us into a different dynamic that doesn't in any way create a benevolent space for humanity. So their outer ring I've called it an environmental ceiling. That's the nine planetary boundaries. Beyond it lies unacceptable environmental degradation for humanity. These are our life support systems that keep us alive. But the inside too, I've added that in, because every human being has the claim to using the resources they need to meet their human rights and lead a dignified life, to having the resources needed for health, water, education, energy, jobs, social equity, gender equality, voice in society. So we need to balance the way we interact with the planet's bountiful resources. We need to ensure that every human being has the resources they need to get out of that blue space of deprivation in the middle, but that we don't use so much resource use, or we don't put so much pressure on our planet systems that we push ourselves over the environmental ceiling. We've got to balance in that space in between. And this is a fundamental challenge to the idea of economic growth that we've lived around a century with. The idea that the line of progress is an ever-rising curve up of GDP growth. That is the wrong vision of what progress looks like. This multi-metric image of, of our well-being tells us that progress looks like dynamic balance. It's learning to balance in that space in between. It's a very, very different vision of what human well-being looks like. But where are we now? Dan can help me. Here's the, here's the tough news. Right now, we're beyond those boundaries on both sides. We've got millions of people living far below that social foundation. We know that millions of people live in poverty. 13% of people in the world don't have enough food to eat. 19% of people don't have access to electricity. 21% of people live on less than $1.25 a day. If every human being had the resources they needed to lead a dignified life, that inner circle would go completely orange. So we're massively under that social foundation of well-being. That's the poverty and social justice challenge globally. But we're also already over these planetary boundaries. We're already well over at least three of them on climate change, on nitrogen use, 
and on biodiversity loss. If those lines were full, they'd almost hit the wall. The biodiversity loss would actually go out and hit that wall. This is our unprecedented challenge and opportunity. We have to get all people in the world out of poverty, which has never been done before, and at the same time, bring ourselves back within those planetary boundaries. That's the challenge for humanity. But what an extraordinary challenge for a generation to have. It's a vision of actually where we want to get to. Not just a line of ever rising growth, but a vision of humanity in that donut space, that donut shaped space in the middle. So let me show you the next. Imagine if we put each of our lives on this table and asked ourselves, how does the way that I vote, shop, travel, eat, bank, volunteer, affect humanity's chance? As many people have said today, it's not all only about changing our personal lives, but of course it's partly about that. But what if we lifted up a level? Dan, help me. What if every company in the world was required by law to draw up its corporate strategy around this table and ask itself, is the product that we're making bringing humanity into this safe and just space? Is it paying a living wage, respecting communities' rights? Is it putting, reducing pressure on all those planetary dimensions? What if the business model had to be drawn up in that space? What if companies had to actually operate and raise money and pay their shareholders or their stakeholders and reorganize what it means to do business in that space. That would see some of the things that Neil Faulkner was talking about, a revolution of the, what we think a business is, moving from profit to non-profit, to corpor from corporations to cooperatives. The transformation of what business is for if it's about bringing people into this space. And then lastly, this is the world's finance minister, the G20 finance ministers, when they met in St. Petersburg last December. Okay, they didn't actually meet around this table. I've just stuck that in the middle. But imagine if they did, because at the moment, we've vi our vision is of ever-rising growth. So that's what they're generating and designing the financial system around. What if they met around this table and asked themselves, what would it mean to create a global financial system that actually was designed to bring humanity into this space? It would be a completely different picture. And that's why we need to visualize and envision where we want to get to. Because if we don't do that, we're not challenging companies, financial leaders, governments to reconsider the direction that we're going in. So we as a, as a movement, a social movement, building a new change from the bottom up, but also demanding change from those in positions of power, need to visualize where we want to get to and hold all policies to account in that direction. Last picture. Oop, last one? No? It's not going... Okay, back to the donut. I was hoping we'd end up back at the... There we are, back at the donut. To me, one of the exciting things is rewriting economics. And today's economic students know that the economic mindset that's being put in the back of their heads is not in any way equipping them to help bring humanity into this space. And the economic students are mobilizing and organizing. Their mindset really matters because they're going to become the policy makers of tomorrow. But also the economic mindset is what we hear on the radio, in the TV news, and read in the media. We've all got an inherited economic mindset from the 20th century. That's all I'm going to say for now. In a few minutes, I'll come back and say some more about how we need to transform that mindset. But I hope you find this donut image one useful part of the compass for humanity's journey in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, Kate Rowley. Uh, next up is going to be Kate Pickett. <laughs> Kate Pickett, you're the co-author of the best-selling book, The Spirit Level, and co-founder of the Equality Trust. You've argued that an equal society is better for everyone, and that many social ills are related to the extreme and growing inequality at the heart of our society. Could you tell us about your vision and why you think equality is such an urgent priority? Sure, and I'm going to hop up on yeah. stage too. It's working. Yeah? I think you have to hold it close. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I really want one of those donut tables. Um, I think it would make dinner parties really, really interesting. <laughs> I want them at the cafeteria at work as well. I think there's a market for those. Um, I'm really excited to be here today, to see so many of you here today to um, discuss how we change everything. I slightly wish that the cover of today's program said democracy, equality and well-being rather than survival. Because if we're going to have a positive vision for the future, it has to be about optimizing our well-being and our quality of life, not just getting by. <laughs> and too often people think that to move towards sustainability simply means reducing our environmental impact. And by doing that, that we're going to have to tighten our belts, we're going to have to live with less, 
were going to have to suffer and sacrifice in some way. But at the same time, we know that our modern economic system, apart from ruining the planet, is not producing human well-being. You know, in the rich, developed world, um, we have systems where some people live in unthought of material luxury, but a huge proportion of the population suffer from problems of mental illness. Huge proportions of the populations in some countries are imprisoned. You know, our children's well-being suffers, our social mobility is low, our quality of life is not great. And of course, we just heard from Kate before about the vast numbers and percentage of people in the world who don't have enough to eat, who don't have adequate shelter or access to the basic resources. Our modern economic system is absolutely disastrous for everybody's well-being, whether they are in a rich country, an emerging economy, or in a poorer country. And inequality in rich countries and in poor countries is extremely damaging if we're going to think about how to improve human well-being and move towards sustainability. In more unequal societies, status matters more. The social distances between people are increased. Everybody becomes more anxious about their status, by how they're seen and judged by others. And what this does is ratchet up the stakes about status. It means that money is much more important. It means that consumerism is fueled by our desire to show our worth through what we own. It's an absolute barrier to creating a more sustainable economy if we all want bigger and better or more cars. You know, if we all want to show through what we possess that we are people of worth. Instead of being judged as worthwhile, worthy people because we are kind or generous or cooperative or share. So consumerism gets directly in the way of creating sustainable economies and it's fueled by inequality. But consumerism actually also has a really damaging effect on our well-being. You know, if you are locked into that status game and that consumerist battle, that is not good for your physical and mental well-being. But inequality also damages relationships between people, so it's not just damaging to our relationship with money or with status. Inequality destroys the social fabric. It ruins cohesion, it lowers trust. And the kind of society we want to move towards is actually going to require us all to be working together, changing everything together, all in this together, and all working in the same direction. And we can't do that if all we're interested in is being out for ourselves. And inequality fosters individualism, it fosters competition, it gets in the way of the cooperation we need. And we know from our research, and my co-author Richard Wilkinson is kindly here with me today, we know from our research that more unequal societies are less likely to act for the common good. They're less likely to recycle, they're less likely to give um, appropriate amounts of foreign aid, they're more likely to be involved in aggression towards other countries. And even their business leaders are less likely to think that their government should comply with environmental regulations. So inequality is it's, it's sort of central to both our well-being and to sustainability. And for the first time, it looks as if that is going to be recognized in international goals. There will be inequality targets in the sustainable development goals. That's really exciting because it means that we can hold all of our governments to account for how they perform on this goal, on these targets. You probably will not be surprised to know that although the Select Committee, the Cross-Parliamentary Select Committee, has recommended that the government approve the sustainable goals as they currently are in draft, 
our current coalition government has said it doesn't believe there should be inequality targets. So one thing we can all do tomorrow, when we've got a little bit of free time, is maybe write to our MPs and ask them to support international measures to improve sustainability across the world. We are not special, we are not exceptional. Our inequality is a problem and it contributes to other people's inequality. And we need to tackle it here as much as we need to fight it elsewhere. My vision for the future is a very optimistic one. What I think about our research is that it offers us possibility of creating a world in which we all feel happier, we all have improved well-being, we all have more time for family and friends and for quality relationships and for knowing that we're not damaging the planet in pursuit of our own well-being. So it's a very optimistic body of research. And when we bring together the green movement with a movement for greater equality, I think we have a real potential to create a positive world for all of us. Thanks. Thank you, Kate Pickett. All right, so we're going to go to the audience now for questions. Um, questions, people will bring them up to me, or you can just stand up, put your hands up, and I'll try to make sure that the roving mics get to you. Um, first, I'd like to say that we do have an announcement. Uh, hashtag TCEUK is now trending in London, so keep tweeting. Thank you very much. Um, all right, and now I'll open the floor to questions. Would you like to go first? Hi, um, I just wanted to um, ask the speakers what their views are on the basic citizen's income. And the speakers will be able to feed back um, at the end of this for a couple of minutes, so we'll keep taking questions. Let's see here. Where are the roving mics? All right, yeah, go ahead. Hello, mine is, mine is just a comment. I think the word equality, and we were talking about language earlier, and I, for me, the word equality is, is not a good word. It's not a useful word. It's liberation that everybody wants. They want much more ordinariness of a, a lot less um, a gap between those with the power and those without. And I think what we're looking for is liberation. Who do I want to be equal to? I don't want to be equal to any of anybody I know particularly. I want liberation from these governments and, you know, all of the issues around the world. Thank you. Uh, gentleman up there. Um, I think the previous speakers were over-optimistic. Um, I agree that we must be much more equal. And we, but I think we must use much, much less. I mean, one of the speakers mentioned, said that 15 percent of people without electricity. But I remember when I was a child, when we lived at Bockhunt, we didn't have electricity, and that was in Herefordshire. And we did well. Lots of these things are not necessary. We can, well, I certainly wouldn't provide everybody with electricity. That's one of the things we can do without. I know that from personal experience. So, um, we, we, uh, although we must try to treat everybody fairly and more equally, we must only use what we need. And that is, uh, I think that's very, very important. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Are you down here? Hi, I think Kate Pickett sort of started touching on this, but one word that I feel like keeps getting sort of skipped over in people's conversations is time. And I think as long as we are kept busy with worrying about how we're going to pay our bills, then, then we don't have the time to do things like this. And I think that's part of the reason why this is middle class, so to speak, because the middle class are making the time and able to make the time. Um, but I, I'd love to hear how we're going to give people more time uh, to do things like this. There's, it's not just about caring or understanding. I think there's many more people out there that care and understand that mm -hmm. they're busy working right now. Yeah. Thank you. Katie, thank you. Uh, Auburn Thurston from Earth Power. A question um, really about citizenship and how citizenship 
can be a route back against consumerism, and particularly from, local, from a localistic point of view. Um, localism and the transition towns have been mentioned once or twice already this morning. Be interested in the panel's thoughts on how that could be brought forward. Uh, you know, we can work. There are some institutions of change if we would only take hold of them for the localism um, uh, agenda. Local councils, for example, Germany particularly, has got a, has got a history of very strong localism. Um, Britain is one of the most centralised states, but the, some of our European models have got localised models of accountability in energy, for example, um, and culture and economic regulation, etc. And I think there's almost a debate to be had in this country about federalism. Thank you very much. <laughs> Gentlemen up there in the back. I just want to come back to that comment about equality because, you see, the thing about it is that I don't think equality means treating everybody the same. Equality does not mean everybody is the same. Equality is about liberating the potential of everyone to an equal degree so that they can actually realise their potentiality. And the problem is that our society is the opposite of that. It crushes individuality, it crushes creativity, and it's about fundamentally a society in which we do not own or control what is produced or how it is produced. There is no involvement democratically in our ability to influence the most important decisions in society. So therefore, when we talk about revolution, I believe we have to talk about actually control over what is produced and how it is produced. We have to, in other words, fight for a society that is based on production for meeting people's needs instead of production which is at the moment all about meeting the interests of a tiny minority's profits. Thank you very much. <laughs> Gentlemen, over here. Um, this is kind of in response to the gentleman on the other side of the room who talked about, you know, scaling back living standards to what we supposedly need. And I think we need to look around and, and say that, that, you know, we're trapped in this debate about um, crises where there's not enough to go around, you know, austerity because there's not enough, because uh, we, we've got to scramble over the few crumbs that are chucked off the table. But when we talk about something like the housing crisis, how can you talk about a crisis when there's empty homes alongside homelessness? Like, that's a contradiction that shouldn't exist. When we talk about not enough time in the world, well, how come there's some people who are forced to be idle because of mass unemployment, while other people have to work two or three jobs just to get by? That's a contradiction that shouldn't have to exist. And I think we, we should be talking about, rather than fighting over these crumbs that are being thrown on the table, we should be demanding the whole bakery. Thank you very much. And then I saw one hand right here. It's been mentioned already today that we, we have a tendency to think in silos. I think everything that's been said is amazing. What we haven't talked about is, is money creation. We've talked about profit and the problem of that, but the sense in which this current system is dependent on being able to control money in a very artificial way. And I think there is hope post-Occupy movement, post £400 billion worth of quantitative easing to really change that argument. But I think unless we can find a way of linking everything that's been discussed here with the apparently abstract issue of, of money creation, I don't think we articulate this possibility of change with its reality, maybe. Thank you. All right, so now I'm just going to give a minute each for a response. Would you like to start? Sure, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for, for your comments. Um, I agree we should not be fighting over crumbs, let's go for the bakery, but neither should we be fighting too much over terminology. Academics tend to love fighting over terminology, but I find it deeply, deeply boring. And if you want to think about um, improving the opportunities for more people to have more liberty, and I want to think about improving opportunities for people to have more equality, I think we're actually talking about the same thing, because these concepts are so intertwined, and we've known this since before the French Revolution. If you want egalité, if you want liberté, if you want fraternité, then all of those things are intertwined, and you need to work to a society that maximizes them all together. Someone asked about the citizen's income, massively in favour, but also of course of the living wage and the banning of zero hour contracts. If we want everybody in this society 
to have the time to get engaged, then those are important mechanisms that will free up people's time um, and free them from time pressures to enable them to engage as citizens. Inequality means that our politics and our economics are dominated by the tiny few. We do need to extend democracy into every sphere of life. Richard and I have recently um, written something for the Fabian Society. You can download it for free from their website, so this is not a plug, really. Um, it's called A Convenient Truth, and it sets out some principles by which economic democracy could be extended um, and equality improved. People also mentioned whether we need local communities taking more action. I just think we need to work at every scale. Local communities can take really important actions. In York, our city council now pays the living wage and since April requires that everyone with whom it contracts and from whom it procures or commissions also pays the living wage. But at the same time... <laughs> We do need the international community and organizations to be pushing for things like inequality and sustainability targets, and we need our national governments to do things as well. We need a grassroots movement, but we also need to be working um, at the top. And as for being overly optimistic, we all need something to get us out of bed in the morning. And I think the idea of working towards a better society for people and planet um, is enough to keep my glass half full. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kate Pickett. Kate Rayworth, would you like to take a minute just to yeah. respond? Thank you. Brilliant, brilliant points that people made. I mentioned the mindset shift that we need if we're going to build an economy that gives us half a chance of getting it into that donut space. <laughs> it's shifting from a, a mindset about accumulation to distribution from degradation that we see now to regeneration of the, of the planet's life support systems, from market-based competition as the predominant form in which we interact to moving over to the collaborative commons, which is so fantastically growing in peer-to-peer -peer networks and the sharing economy, from an idea of progress as growth to a vision of progress as dynamic balance, and from an idea that we is a national concept or even a personal household one to we as a planetary. This is the era of the planetary household and we need an economics that takes us there. So in response to some of the points made, I completely agree we need to think about money creation because that's part of the accumulation drive. So how do we take the accumulation out of the system? It's about rethinking where money comes from, about rethinking that profit motive at the heart of business. And there's all sorts of wonderful movements looking at how you can take that accumulative drive out of the economy and shift over towards distribution. I agree also in a living wage, in a citizen's income, but not just a citizen's income in the UK. I think we need a citizen's income worldwide because we need to get everybody out of poverty. <laughs> That brings me to the point about electricity that somebody made, and I understand that, you know, earlier generations grew up without electricity and actually many people had wonderful lives. I used to work for Oxfam, and every time Oxfam would take, uh, respond to a disaster and build refugee camps or water and sanitation facilities, one of the most important pieces of equipment was solar panels to be able to provide electricity right there on the spot. And actually I think electricity is the one thing that I would never cross off that list because the solar power revolution and the renewable energy that's suddenly the solar energy is becoming an idea of an abundance, not a scarcity. And if we tap into that technology, we can have distributed laterally based networks, the democratically owned electricity power, People can have mobile phones, and once you've got people with a mobile phone, you can transfer income to anybody in the world. And once you've got the phone address book of that bottom billion people in the world, the idea that you can't get everybody in the world out of poverty suddenly just becomes a last century rejection. And actually, the new technologies that are coming through force all sorts of political possibilities that are really exciting. Thank you so much, Kate Raver. All right, so moving right along. Our next speaker is going to be Paul Mason. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. So, Paul, you've been economics editor for Channel 4 News and Newsnight, and have just written a book called Post Capitalism. As a leading critic of our economic system, could you talk about the key elements of your vision for a new economy? 
I could, and thank you. Um, if you agree with some of the things that people are saying here today, what would be really good is if at the end of this session, um, all the speakers didn't get mobbed, because everybody else was turning around to their friend and saying, what are we going to do about this? Or ringing their mum or their sister, uh, and saying, actually, that was really interesting. Let's think about what we are going to do. Because I, I love the young age profile of this, and the ethnic as this the ethnicity of, of this uh, this uh, meeting, but one of the problems for your generation is 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 the, the uh, you, there's a feeling of, of, of paralysis or fatalism, and my generation who failed by pursuing a particular model of activi activism and social change, um, at least had one thing: we did things. And we didn't stand around um, supposedly brilliant authors and thinkers at the end. We would said, screw them, let's do our own thing. So, in that spirit, I'm only offering this as a, as a set of ideas. See, I think capitalism is dying. The evidence is all around you. The debt overhang is one thing. The, uh, what they call them, stranded assets. Stranded assets of the hydrocarbons. That mean that if you burn them, the planet fries. If you don't burn them, the stock market collapses. Um, the cost of ageing, which will bankrupt 60% of all countries uh, by 2050, even if they carry out austerity. Um, all those are symptoms, but the, the, the fundamental thing that's driving the death of capitalism is that it's lost its ability to do what it's done three or four times in its 200-year history, which is to, 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 to use new technology to create higher value jobs, higher wage jobs, and a higher standard of living for everybody. And the reason it's done that is because of the specific nature of information technology. Information technology just makes things cheaper. It may, makes information things cheaper, it makes aeroplanes cheaper, it makes labour cheaper. So I, what I think is that the route out of capitalism is possibly not, well it's certainly not, the one imagined by socialists in the 20th century. Um, the, the, via the state, via planning, via the working class actually, it's not that. It's something else. We are all workers in a giant social factory. We reproduce the capitalist system every day whether we are earning 40k or 15k. And we re reproduce it by buying its brands, taking the bullshit that they uh, talk, tell us and not changing our lives. That's how, that's how we reproduce it. So, this is the problem. What do we do? I think what we have to do is to use the Wikipedia principle. We replace stuff that is produced by the market by, by stuff that is produced by non-market mechanisms using collaborative, local, small-scale um, practice where we have to and where we can. But there's another bit, a, a kind of big end uh, of, of, the, of the equation we have to think about, which I'll come to. Um, in doing this, What's important is not just the setting up of small-scale local initiatives, peer-to-peer -peer networks, peer-to-peer -peer production, co-ops, etc. It's thinking about the design of the whole transition. This is the great challenge for your generation and mine, as long as we're still here, and that is to, to think about what the transition is. In engineering, when they designed the tail fin of the typhoon bomber, uh, of, sorry, of the tornado bomber, uh, 30 years ago, the, the, the engineers using slide rules and calculators stress tested it 12 times. When they did the typhoon, its replacement, they stress tested it 186 million times on computers. And what that means is, if you do virtual, I've not gone any slides, but if you do virtual manufacturing, this will be my slide if I add one. Um, old engineering is this. All, the cost of mistakes and changes starts here, and then it ramps up as you build the prototypes, and it goes really high for the first few things you make, and then it kind of tails off over a long period as your engineers and factories get better at making it. In virtual manufacturing, where well, you don't just 3D design the plane, you 3D design it, you 3D build it, every screw has the properties of a brass screw, every strut has the properties of carbon fibre, you put it together on the computer, you fly it on the computer 186 million times a day if you have to. This is what happens to the curve, the cost. It goes, cost of changes and mistakes, high at the beginning on the computer, low, and then when you make the thing, zero. If we apply that to social change, it becomes really obvious what you have to do. You have to imagine now. You have to change in your mind. You have to, yeah, and we can build computer models of the things we want to do. So the change process has to, it is, it's not irrelevant to change, to do the imagining of the big scale changes that the other two speakers have talked about. So to finish, the other reason I think capitalism is clearly dying is because 
What will replace it is not an economic system. We already know it, is all, it already has to be an environmentally and socially sustainable system. But the, you know, if you know anything about the, the way feudalism died and capitalism came about, you will know that the feudalists couldn't see merchants and banks and moneylenders and factories as economic. They thought what was economic was what went on in fields and castles and wars. That wars were economic as well for feudalism. So they were looking, oh, yeah, I'm not interested in you, banker. Oh, I've gone bust. Um, <laughs> Edward III, uh, you know, I'm not really interested in your world. This is what Wolf Hall is about, that great speech in Wolf Hall, where he says, you know, the new world is the world of bankers and trade. Now, for us, that transition means that that new world is when a woman leaves an abusive man, when a gay man comes out, when people start to live a non-binary lifestyle, when they set up a co-op, when they decide with their family to do something... Uh, charitable or cooperative or NGO style. Capitalism doesn't see this as economic, but that is the thing that is coming. Because if we use the technology we have, and if we use the, this ability to create things collaboratively for free, which trickles over from the information world into the world of things, then we can have less work, machines that cost nothing, and the thing that you want from that big wheel thing that you came before. You can have an economically sustainable society. So that's what I think. Thank you so much, Paul Mason. <clears throat> All right. So our next speaker is Howard Johns. Hi, Howard. Hiya. How are you? <laughs> All right, thank you. Good. <laughs> so, um, Howard, you've been at the forefront of establishing community-run renewable energy in the UK. And you're about to publish a book about the energy revolution that's underway here. Yep. Um, that's empowering communities to set up their own renewable energy companies. Um, could you tell us about what's been achieved so far and what your hopes are for the future of community-owned renewable energy? Certainly. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for having me here today. So, there is an energy revolution underway and I'm going to try in five minutes tell you why you need to be part of it. So in the UK we've got about 20% of our electricity from renewables last year. It's come on a long way in a few years so we've gone from virtually nothing to 650,000 homes with solar on them um, in just four years in the UK. Uh, we're still one of the dirtiest countries in, in Europe and perhaps the world. And to get from that nothing to 650,000 solar homes there's been countless battles, which I'm sure many of you have seen. I was involved with uh, taking the government to the High Court three times and uh, fighting ministers in the media and all that sort of stuff. The, 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 the mad thing is people want renewables. 70% of the people want solar. They want wind turbines. It just seems that the corporates that are buying the advertising space in the media don't want us to know. Um, and they don't want this stuff because it's a, it's a fundamental threat to their business model. You know, the backdrop is you've got six corporates that own very large power stations. You're all at the end of them. Your interaction is you have to pay the bill, basically. Um, those power stations, you stick 100 bags of coal in, 60 of them go straight up the chimney before any, any electricity leaves the power station. It comes to your house. Uh, effectively, only 20% of the energy that goes in at the start is used. You know, that is a ridiculous waste. And you contrast that with three billion people around the world that only access to energy is, uh, you know, an open fire, highly polluting, very dangerous. So we've got this crazy bloated system in, in the north and, you know, energy poverty in the south and energy poverty in the north as well. Thousands of people dying every year from cold. So it's, it's, it's a mad system right now. But there is a revolution going on. So people talk about countries around the world. I'm going to give you a few stats. So Denmark last year, 40% of their electricity came from wind turbines alone. 60% of their homes are heated by district heating networks and often they're powered by renewables. Um, there's one island called Samso. In 97 they decided to go have a go at renewables. In 10 years they became net positive, i.e. they create more energy than they need on their island. It's totally possible to do this and it, to do it very quickly. In Germany last year, 28% of their electricity came from renewables. Um, and the amazing thing that's happened in the last sort of 10, 15 years is that solar and wind are fast becoming the cheapest forms of, of power and energy anywhere in the world. They're not quite there here yet, but in Africa they certainly are. And that becomes a massive game changer. Why would you ever build another coal-fired power station when the power coming out of it is more expensive? You wouldn't, okay? So, 
Germany is an amazing story. Denmark's an amazing story. And what's happened there is a transference of ownership. So right now here, you've got six big companies. They own the assets. That's the way it is. In Germany, they only own 15% of the renewable assets. The rest's owned by communities, councils, individuals. It's a fundamental shift in the way the energy system's structured. And it happens very quickly. And the corporates are not quick to respond. But we as individuals, as communities, as groups can move quickly and make this happen. So in Germany you've got 900 now energy cooperatives. So cooperatives owning renewable generation, providing power to their town. It's totally possible to do this in your town too. And the most interesting thing in Germany now for me is the tipping point that's been reached with the incumbent business model. So there's the big four in Germany. They're the same as the big six here. Um, E.ON last week announced that basically it was going to put all its coal assets and all its nuclear assets into one company and continue forwards with its renewable assets because the coal ones don't make any money anymore. So they're going to sell them off, i.e. they're going to write them off, they're stranded assets. So 28% of electricity on the grid is a tipping point and it's causing a fundamental shift in the structure of the energy system in Germany and it could happen here. So this is about transformation, it's about going from consumer to prosumer, i.e. you produce and you consume, i.e. a network is going from big central to decentralised. You know, so it needs lots of people to get engaged to make that happen. It's time to build a new fleet of companies in, in your town, creating local power, creating somewhere for the divestment that we're all going to be taking out of the fossil fuel companies to go into. So this could be a new form of asset, basically, reducing CO2 in your community and saving money for people in your community. It started here in the UK. Can a quick show of hands if there are any community energy companies here? You've got, oh look, there's a few, there's a few around the place, so speak to them. 100% um, renewables happening. Costa Rica has been 100% renewable this year for electricity. Nor Norway is 100% renewable for electricity. Iceland's 100% renewable for um, electricity and heat, basically. So this is about getting together, organising yourselves, taking practical steps to repower your town. Uh, I was with Balkum, the first fracking village, about a year ago, and I got invited to a public meeting to say, what can we do differently? Now today they have a new company called Repower Balkum. It's built its first small power station. I think within three years they'll be net positive for electricity. It's totally possible to do it and they'll do it with an investment of less than three million pounds and that will pay a great return to people who invest. So they don't call it power for nothing and it's time to reclaim it and you can all be involved creating jobs, creating new companies. Thank you. Thank you so much Howard. All right, uh, very quickly, we're going to have Ruth London from um, Fuel Poverty Action come up and give us a little talk about the Energy Bill of Rights. I'm sure some of you have heard about it. Okay, the Energy Bill of Rights aims to make the practical connections that Naomi Klein was talking about. It lists eight rights. This is it, you've probably seen it around. It lists eight rights, and the first of them is the right to affordable energy to meet our basic needs. And the second is the right to energy that does not harm us, the environment, or the climate. Now, there's been a deliberate attempt to convince us that we have to choose between the climate and our pockets, that renewables are costing us extra on our bills and fracking will make it all cheaper. That's in the face of all the evidence from Balkum and other places and that uh, fossil fuels, in fact, are killing thousands through climate change and also killing thousands through fuel poverty. There's a big unrecognized part of our movement People in every corner of this country are fighting the big six energy companies. They're fighting over their bills and they need some solidarity. Nobody should have to f face those thieves and vultures on their own. Fuel Poverty Action is organizing with pensioners, disabled people, single mothers, migrants and students. We aim to demonstrate in practice that the climate movement actually cares about people being able to heat their homes. And this is a bit of a shameless plea, but I have to tell you frankly that we need more members to do this work. We need people who want to build a united movement for the climate and against poverty. One more point. A third of our heating leaks out through roofs and walls. The money that built Drax Power Station could have insulated all of East Anglia, which would have saved lives and would have saved the energy, all the energy that Drax has produced. 
But of course, that wouldn't be counted as economic growth. This is an upside-down economy. It's based on squandering energy, including human energy, which is thrown away in useless, soul-destroying, climate-destroying jobs. Speaking of changing everything, I personally support not just the basic income, but the new petition for a living wage for mothers and other carers who are among the unpaid caregivers that Naomi referred to. Woo. I have copies here. That offers a vision of an economy based on human need and a way to get off the treadmill of work for the market. But let's start with what the Energy Bill of Rights says. We all have a right to energy that is owned by us and run in our interests. We can't afford to leave energy in the hands of the profiteers. And we do have the human energy to take it back. Thank you so much, Ruth. That was great. All right, so we're going to have some uh, audience participation now. Feel free to ask questions. Um, for either Paul Mason, um, Howard Johns, or Ruth London. Uh, just before we do that, I want to let you know TC UK is now trending nationally. So keep tweeting. Um, <laughs> also, I'd like to read out a question that someone has passed to me. Um, I think any of you could answer this however you like. So Naomi wrote an article for The Nation um, regarding the Black Lives Matter debate and how it informs climate change debate. It addressed the main reason Western countries um, are apathetic towards climate change, which they said is because so far it has only had a real effect on poor black and brown communities. Do you believe a catastrophic natural disaster will have to happen in the white world for people to care? And I'm opening the floor to questions. Put up your, keep your hand up if you hate your landlord or you have a shit relationship with your home. Okay, because for me, this is fundamental. I would love to put solar panels on my roof, and I got a quote, and it was seven and a half thousand pounds, and it would take about ten years to pay off. If I had the cash, I'd do it. I couldn't convince my landlord. And I'd love to hear uh, any thoughts from the panelists about how to address landlords on this issue. <laughs> from Tuesday, Bannister House Solar Co-op. Now that's, that's, that's the first part. Uh, I also work at the TUC Trade Union Congress. This afternoon we've got Mark Suarez <laughs> speaking at the plenary. It's great. I mean, the trade unions have, you know, engaged in climate change and the green job stuff. And it was great that Naomi name-checked the One Million Climate Jobs Initiative. But, you know, trade unions are all that we're trying are really not yet there's not enough, say, presence here today, and really would welcome the views of the panels in what more we can do to engage people at work with the climate change challenge. Thank you. You've already spoken. So, a, a little bit starstruck by Paul Mason, but there was two questions in what he said that kind of I, I wanted to see if you could expand upon. One is the idea of computer modelling and whether, I think imagining the future is an incredibly powerful thing to do, but to what extent can you actually model something as complex as people, our collective interactions, kind of the way that we're shaped by our environment. The second thing is on the point about how we transition to that future, because I think decentralised structures are obviously something that's quite a feature of all sorts of things, but it's also true that more and more things, power, production, things that are really key are increasingly centralised in fewer and fewer hands which means the question of how you take that power is quite directly posed. And to kind of borrow something from Michael Rosen's going on a bear hunt, it does sort of break the question, if you can't go round it, if you can't go over it, at some point you've got to go through it, which does pose the question of how in a very direct way, which is linked to kind of how we think about futures, how we also get it. 
Thank you. We only have time for one more hand. Uh, man, man with the microphone. Is this on? Um, I think one of the real challenges that faces us is how we construct and how we get out the narrative into the mainstream. Um, it's wonderful to hear these percentages of how many people are in favour of um, maybe renewable energy or how many people are in favour of renationalising the railways or in supporting the NHS. But of course, if we were to look at the mainstream media, that doesn't appear hardly anywhere. And, and I mean, it's great to have Paul Mason here. But I mean, I've got a friend who works in, in, in mainstream broadcasting in New York, and you should hear the comments that the anchors of the CBS News come out and say off air. I mean, they don't believe a word of what they're saying on air. Um, so how do we how do we here get our messages out into the mainstream media, or do we need to create our own mainstream media that will get these messages out? Thank you very much. Unfortunately, guys, we're already running about 15 minutes behind, so I'm going to have to cut questions there and allow the speakers to give some feedback. Paul Mason. A minute, yeah? Yeah, just a minute, sorry. <laughs> Solar panels, rent, uh, rent landlords. Uh, I mean, there is a role for the state. And the state, I think, in this transition is a regulator. I think it has to abolish itself economically quite quickly, but it has to be a regulator, like the early capitalist state was, creating central banks, creating a factory system, allowing child labour in the sense of, in the, I, cap, the state created early capitalism. So you do it that way, the simple uh, answer, you make rent control everywhere, and you make it so that rip-off landlordism is, is abolished. People leave the industry and then you get lots of houses given back to, presumably, temporarily the state or small local groups. Um, on your issue of modelling, it's a really good point, and I take, I, what do you do? Um, how do you model complex systems? I think, I think some of it can be done, but in other words, economics has to become what a Soviet, a, a Soviet economist once called social technology. It has to actually become the accurate modelling of complex and, and random events. And I think it can, you, can, you can start, anyway, you can start trying, um, but you know, modelling, for example, the introduction of a basic income, 186 million variables of it, would be a good way to do it. You could do it in a couple of days on the supercomputer. NASA has a billion data points on its climate model. The problem with economics is they're dealing with abstract, stochastic models that have no relationship to reality. Um, so that's the only two things I can really say. I mean, the rest of it is loads of loads of things to talk about, but no time. Thank you. Thanks. Howard Jones. I mean, on the, on the point about landlords, yeah, totally. But that's why we need community energy companies to normalise this, to get loads of people engaged. So you want access to solar? Well, get involved. Be, be, invest in that one. If you can only invest, invest five quid, at least make a start, basically. You know, so... And there we go. And, and, and then we have to make this the new normal. You know, we have to make it the new normal. So start with the easier landlords. Start with the social landlords. They want to do this. They want. They, you know, they have goals to meet to make to make uh, conditions better for people in their homes. Start with them. Take your community energy company to them and say, look, we'll raise the money. We'll own the systems. You give the benefit to the people living in the houses. In terms of the, the question of do we need a natural disaster, we, we, there is a natural disaster going on already, people just aren't aware of it. Maybe it isn't affecting them in their, in their homes, but hey, flooding in the UK, it's already happening, guys. Um, and in terms of people at work, I think there's the same opportunity, you know. If we can turn this into something that people can do, can make a living from, you know, it changes everything. It really does. It, rather than it being something we wave banners around, this is something you can buy into. You could buy power from your local, local energy company. It changes everything. So I think the workplace will... You know, it will happen that we're going into workplaces, working with companies saying, right, we've got a big office building here, let's put solar on it, let's, do, let, let's repower it, basically, as a, as a staff team, maybe, we'll set up our own company. But I, that's probably had my minute. Thank you. All right, I see a lot of hands in the air, and I wish that I could call on you. Um, what I will say is that our next couple of hours in the workshops after lunch are all participatory. So anything you have to say, I beg of you, say it there. Raise your voice. Let people hear you come together to talk about how we can build a movement. 
Um, our next speaker is coming to us from Nigeria. He is on the phone. It's Nigerian election day today, so the internet is not running too well, which is a good time to basically say, you know, I hear a lot about, you know, oh, we should use the internet, we should use social media to create this new platform for change. Not everyone in the world has access to the internet. Um, so we need to start thinking about other ways that we can involve the rest of the world in what we want to do as well. Uh, Nima Bossi is one of Africa's leading environmentalists and social justice campaigners and he's the winner of the Right Livelihood Award. He's been an activist for decades and um, he's on the phone right now. Not me. Thank you. 
Thank you, Nima Basi. Thank you very much. Live from Nigeria. All right, our final speaker for Vision is Mr. Raul Martinez. Um, Raul is a TCEI organizer. He's the director of the award-winning documentary, The Lottery of Birth. He's an artist and is about to have his first book published called Creating Freedom. Raul, could you draw together some of the themes from our discussion? What does Vision mean to you? Okay, thanks, Caitlin. Um, is this on? Is it working? I don't know. No. Here, you use this one. Thank you. Um, okay, yes, yeah, so I'll try and draw together some of the strands of this um, inspiring session. Our system is failing in three fundamental ways. It's unjust, undemocratic, and unsustainable. And these failings share a common cause, but also a common solution. That's why the tagline for today's event is democracy, equality, survival. These are the pillars for a new society, and they stand together or not at all. Now, if we're going to survive, we need a system, an economy that sits comfortably within the ecological boundaries of planet Earth. This means constraining the growth imperative at the heart of capitalism. In practice, we're going to have to set absolute limits on the use of resources, so the scale of the overall system is held steady. From here on, less really is going to be more. But if we limit resources, equality has to take center stage. For decades, we've had economists telling us that growth is a substitute for equality. Well, if that's true, then equality can now be a substitute for growth. If the pie is not going to get any bigger, we're going to have to share it out much more fairly. And yet, if that is going to be remotely attainable, we're also going to have to find a way to share out power more democratically. Because it's power that actually determines the future. But there are many forms of power. And inequalities of power in one domain can destroy equality elsewhere. I mean, we've seen this with the creep of market logic into every area of our lives. The logic of one pound, one vote has completely overwhelmed the logic of one person, one vote. And this really can't continue. I mean, there's no way that we can address climate change while our governments are locked into ecocidal trade deals, while they're controlled by profit-maximizing corporations, big banks, um, giant energy firms, and you know, private healthcare companies. Democracy needs to be rescued, expanded, and reinvented. And the truth is, political equality and economic equality have always been two sides of the same coin. Now, when we talk about vision, what we're really talking about is values. We're talking about the big questions, who we are, who we want to be, the meaning of life itself. And of course, capitalism gives, gives us some answers. It assumes that we're greedy, selfish, utility maximizers. 
And if you look at the way capitalism has organized humanity around the globe, you'd be forgiven for thinking that the sole point of human existence is a maximization of profit. Now, we know that's not right. We know these values are as demeaning as they are destructive. For too long, we've been forced to look at the world through the distorting lens of markets, a lens which blinds us to the unique and sacred beauty of people and planet. Life is not about profit. The driving force of humanity is not greed. Now, the point of social change is to take our values and turn them into a reality. It's all about challenging, changing, and sometimes breaking our laws and institutions so we can more effectively preserve and protect what matters most to us. Now, right now, to protect what matters most to us, we have to achieve change incredibly fast. We're going to need millions of climate jobs. We're going to need a basic income, shared work, and a shorter working week. We're going to need global capital and resources. We're going to need um, a renaissance in political democracy. But we're also going to need democracy in the workplace, in our universities and schools. We're going to need 100% renewable energy, education for all, healthcare for all, rent caps, social housing. We're also going to need massive investment in green infrastructure and public transport. And crucially, we need to repay our ecological debt to developing nations around the globe. We need all of that, but we need much more. And social change isn't just about refashioning institutions out there in the world. Because whatever rights we have, whatever procedures are in place, it's actual real human beings that breathe life into our institutions. Yes, one minute. Okay. Um, and so, you know, we are the timber from which a new world is going to be constructed, which is why collectively we have to strive to deepen our understanding, um, develop our characters, and open our hearts to each other. Just to sum up, you know, the real issue here is not an absence of solutions or alternatives. The real is issue is an absence of power to experiment with them. Now's the time to change that. Now's the time to release the collective potential we have for creativity, compassion, courage, cooperation. And yet to do that, we're going to have to overcome the many labels which too often have divided us in the past. We're going to need to remember that before we're a Marxist, a socialist, an anarchist, or a green, before we're a professional or a unionist, man or woman, before we're Christian or Muslim or black or white, before we're any of these things, we're all just human beings with a flicker of existence on this beautiful rock spinning through space. If collectively we can imagine that and we can remember that, then we stand a chance of becoming the change that we all desperately so want to see. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you guys. So this closes our, vision, our, our session on vision.